All we can really hope for is that after a certain amount of shootings, some of the shooters are shooting future shooters. That's the only thing as Americans that we can hope happens is that just by by proximity, they'll shoot somebody else crazy oh and then we will prevent a shooting by letting a shooter do a shooting. Sure. sure. You know what I mean? Sure. It's a ratio. Okay, though. It's a ratio. Okay, though. That might be the best question I've ever been asked. <laughs> You's a phenomenal person. I mean, you legendary. I am a fan of you, my brother. Josh Johnson is one of my favorite comedians. He's back because I love him. It's Josh Johnson on Touré Show. Tell me about your special. Okay, so... I have a special out on Peacock, which you you already knew because you said, tell me about your special. <laughs> so you, you're already on the up and up. This is for the other people that don't know me as well as you know me. Um, nice little living room set. Yeah. Little yeah. couch action. Yeah. Evokes yeah. home. Yeah. So we basically what I did with the project was I took an hour of my like talk therapy and the things that I talked about in therapy and then took it to like, its final form transformed into jokes and everything. So when you watch the special, you'll see a lot of segments start with uh, me being asked a question or bringing the first idea up in the therapy setting and then snap to me on stage, finishing the idea with a joke. And, and it sort of shows the transformation of the trajectory of the joke, really, of like I started things out not knowing how I felt or being troubled by something. And then I ended up in a place where not only did I know how I felt about it, but I was ready to share it with people. Mm -hmm. And so that's the basic gist of it. Um, and yeah, it, it felt like a bit more, the people now, I feel like I, I did a good job because now people are asking me, they're like, where do you think you go from here? I'm like, geez, I don't think I finished I'm still here. comedy. Like, I mean, <laughs> I'm still here at yeah, this moment. I'm, I'm living now. Out. Yeah, just came out and- Where'd you shoot it? I was in LA in the bourbon room. Are you supposed to do specials in the big cities? I thought you were supposed to do them in the smaller cities because people will be more excited. You can, but like, I guess my thing is I want to do specials based on locations, based on how I felt about the place at the time. Okay. And to me, because I'm not in LA often enough doing shows, LA felt like an option to to do the special kind of like you would do it in Michigan or you would do it in Florida or something like that, where you find the appropriate setting yeah. and you, you know, you're, you're able to make it work because the people that are coming to the show haven't seen you in so long yeah. that they are just as excited as if I had gone to sort of uh, middle America. Therapy is interesting for creative people. Cause I think some of our, trauma mm -hmm. our twistedness as creative people mm -hmm. is part of what the people like right and we're sort of working that out in one way or another through and in the art mm -hmm. and you know you don't get to therapy and like oh now i'm all fixed but like yeah in becoming uh more i guess at peace with yourself and mm -hmm. soothing some of your traumas I would worry, am I losing some of my creative fire because you are ironing out the knots in my spirit sort of thing? No, because I'm still petty. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, like there's still, like all the problems still exist. You just fix the old ones. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So it's like, I'm still, if anything, now I'm painfully aware of when I'm being some type of way or when something is is uh, because of something else, not because of the first reaction. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm more aware now of if I'm being jealous or if I'm being um, unnecessarily judgmental <laughs> or whatever, but it doesn't mean I stop doing those things. Wait, did you, know you I mean? get down to why you are that way? Uh, only sort of. I think that, I think some of it is recognizing that I do it and never letting it come out to other people, if that makes sense. So not necessarily, it still sucks inside, but not making it someone else's problem is like, 
I think all you can ask of a person is that it's like, if I'm jealous of you, first thing that I do is take stock of the fact that I'm jealous of you. And then I can think about why or, or like work on myself, whatever. But the, but the thing is that you and I can still be friends because it never even occurs to you that I'm jealous of you because I never let that become your problem. You know what I mean? Now it, you're able to keep that to yourself. Not, not just keep it to myself, but fix it before it ever becomes a problem. Because jealousy for another person doesn't come out to the other person as jealousy or else everyone would be so transparent the world would be sure. easy. It comes out as like, why did you have to say that to me? Or like, it's me causing a different problem to have a problem with you, to make you do something imperfect, to then act like that's the reason I'm mad at you, you know? Oh, uh, taking you if, down a peg, yeah. Exactly, whereas if I'm just like, I don't know why, but like we're buds and we and we chat and stuff like that, but like, ah, oh, you know what it is? He got a lifetime achievement award. Uh, and I don't know if I've done anything with my lifetime. Uh, uh, so maybe I'm feeling some type of way towards him. Uh, and maybe I should think about that before I like it's funny pop you, off. You feel that as jealousy externally. Cause when I see that, mm -hmm. um, I feel, I just feel bad about myself. Mm -hmm. Like I remember, I don't know what happened, but somebody was like, yeah, Mike Tomlin, head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, won a Super Bowl. Forgive me if I'm getting the number wrong, if it's one or two. I, I swear he's got at least one, I swear. Yeah. Um, you know, 40 years old. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like, I've done okay, but goddamn. Yeah, This nigga's yeah. crushing the building. He's fucking coaching a marquee franchise in the yeah. NFL for years and years, winning the Super Bowl. And he's just cracking four. And this is not new, but like, it, yeah. and, and, it, but I, and I didn't feel it against him. I felt like, damn, you got to step your game up. Like, damn. So it was mm -hmm. all internal. Yeah. But you located outward. Yeah, because I think that, to me, it's it's the defense mechanism, so I don't do it internally. Mm. So then it's like, if I, if I only look outwardly, I never have to look at myself. So then if I'm looking outwardly and I'm having these bad feelings, if I stop myself and take stock of why I'm having them, then I can recognize it's like, well, you're feeling bad about yourself, which is why you would ever try to make it external in your mind. And then, you know, now we we get to a more, uh, a more peaceful, place quicker, sure. but I'm still the same person, <laughs> which is, which is a problem and not, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, you have to be something. No one can so be perfect. You, so you've done all this therapy and you're kind of the same person. You're just yeah. more aware of who you are. Yeah. It's like, I, I, I would make it in my mind. I'd be like, all right, it's almost like therapy is a mental version of like going to the gym. You can go to the gym and you can get big, you can get cut. You could be, you could look like a different person to the point that you're so shredded and you can still be scared of spiders. <laughs> like I've seen big dudes like wild out when they thought they saw a spider. But they are actually stronger than they used to be. Yeah. If you just kept going to the gym and there was no actual improvement. Yeah. You'd be like, I got to get a trainer. I got to do something different. This is not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that for me, that's, that's what it ended up being. So, you know, it does, it does feel like it feels different. I, I, I am, uh, I've already been told, so I guess I don't have to say, I hope, but I've already been told that it helps keep the audience engaged because we do snap back and forth a couple times. Mm. So we don't do it so often that you're like, I'm not watching a comedy special, but mm. we do it just enough that it always keeps your attention because it is very easy unless someone is incredibly famous, like ridiculously famous, or they haven't done it in a long time. It's very easy to start to kind of, if you're at home, start to kind of drop out of someone's hour at the 45 minute mark. Mm. Like, cause, and you finish it because you're almost done. And the whole thing's been funny, but like when you're there, Someone can captivate you for hours. Mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. you're at home and you have your at-home distractions and you're getting text messages, whatever, it's very hard to engage people for a full hour. And so you have to do something at least 10% different. And I think that that's what we did here. Wait, is there a childhood experience that you guys sort of keep, you and your therapist sort of keep landing on as like, this is a big reason why you feel these ways and why you've become the person you've become. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, 
I didn't, I was very fortunate as a, as a child because of the people around me, but I didn't grow up with a lot of money. And so I think that I very much want a lot of money. I you I'm, want that now because yeah. you didn't have it. I'm very open about it too. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, oh, I would love to be rich. I have no problem saying it. I have no problem saying it in the special. And it's like, obviously there's, there's like lines. There's, you're not going to do everything for money and you're not going to sell your soul for money or anything. Yeah. But, but being um, completely and totally financially stable has been a life goal of mine for a long time. And like doing things like uh, taking care of my mom, like I make sure my mom doesn't have to work and stuff like that. It's like those things are the most important career things to me. I, I didn't think I was, I didn't feel like I could let myself believe I was good at comedy until my mom didn't have to work. And then that would be like, cause in my mind, someone who is great at comedy makes enough money through comedy to take be able to take care of their mom. Mm. And so, you know, that's kind of where I'm coming from. I mean, I was going to ask you, so what is money? Is it security or power? But you're saying it's security. Yeah. It's, it's a sense of security. It's, the power is like, power is like so fleeting. Like, like well, I, if you I, have money mm -hmm. that gives you power. I'm fully with you, but because of how life comes at you, like, okay, one of my favorite things in the world, this is like top five favorite things, Okay, is when just you're out in New York, right? Maybe you're walking, maybe you're in an Uber, whatever. When I see, this is going to sound meaner than I mean for it okay, to be, okay. but when I see bad things happen to people who clearly look like businessmen, right? Okay, okay. Because it's like you have all of this perceived power just from the look. You may have a lot of power from the money and the connections that you have. But I, so when I got back from Australia, I saw, okay, this is so, I don't know. This is very mean, but whatever. There was a guy who was in a full like 90s level business suit. Like when I say okay. 90s, I mean, it was a little too big. Right. Okay. Like full like 90s. Wall, the movie Wall Street. Movie Wall Street. Masters of the game. Had a briefcase, which yeah. is, you don't need one. No, no. Not now. No, not no. anymore. Who has a briefcase? He, he did. <laughs> and it's like, I hope his lunch was in there. But anyway, <laughs> he had the briefcase, had the suit. And I saw him, I saw him slip and fall. And the way that he slipped and fell was already so funny. Because he didn't, <laughs> he didn't like fall, like his feet didn't go in the air or whatever. But he slid like, you know, like a baseball player slides into home. Sure. He looked like that. Okay. But for the New York ground, which was kind of wet. Okay. And so then he gets up and the suit, the suit must have been made of paper because he gets up and some of the pants leg is ripped. So he like fell hard. Right. And as I'm passing him, this man clearly slipped on a hot wheel. Like just a stray Hot Wheel in the world, like Home Alone style. Okay, there was a Hot Wheel like and he slipped on it, like a little yeah. baby car. Okay, a little baby car. Okay, and I was like, man, all that power, and you can still slip on Hot Wheels like me, because I could have slipped on that Hot Wheel. Right, right. That could have right. been me. Right, right, you know, right. I wear jeans, so they wouldn't have ripped like that. Right, but like, right. But I was, I was like, ah, power is like, it's also so relative, because then there's usually someone with more power, they're usually in proximity to people with power, but in the shadows, there's like, there's so much going on in that game that you're never really secure. You actually buy yourself out of security trying to gain um, power Yeah. to me. I think a lot of power comes from people coming to you and you being a sort of kingmaker in a sense. And sure. that's power yeah. that may come and go, but people have to come to you. Power that that needs to grab more power is like you're playing a dangerous game. That's what most of the TV shows are about, you know? Wait, is your therapist male or female, black or white? So in the special, we do use uh, a female who is a white actress. Right. Right? Um, but... In real life, I've had a few therapists, so I've I've really played with the spectrum and the rainbow of therapy. Because to me, therapy, you have to you have to approach it. To me, to really get somewhere, you almost have to approach it the way you approach dating. 
Because to stick yes. with the first person you find is no. not always good. And I've had friends. I've been lucky enough that I did not have these situations. But I have had friends who have had therapists where when they told me what they talked about in therapy, I was like, they said that to you? <laughs> And look, I'm not a doctor. Maybe that's exactly how doctors <laughs> should be operated. But I was like, no. wait, they, they said that to you after you told them what you just told me? And so now I feel like they're not a good therapist because my friend is now doing like post-therapy with me about right. what they said. Right. Which does, unless my friend is lying, does sound bad. <laughs> I I want there to be what we would see as like speed dating mm -hmm. to connect therapists and clients. Yeah. Cause I don't know what your vibe is. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, maybe just talking to you for 60 or 90 seconds, I can mm -hmm. get the vibe. And I'm like, I feel like opening up my whole spirit and heart to you. Mm -hmm. I don't really feel Fred. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're very professional, but Sophie, I don't feel, but yeah. Jill, Mm -hmm. I feel like I could probably sit on her couch and tell her things that I know I shouldn't tell her. Right. And yeah, like, and how yeah. are you going to know? And cause, cause I've thought a lot about going to therapy. I was in therapy for a minute. We could talk about that. But like, I was like, do I need a black person? And I know some mm -hmm. black people are like, oh, I would only therapize with a black person. Like I respect that. But I'm like, maybe a white person could get me out of my head in certain ways. Do I need a woman? Obviously it's much easier sharing difficult things with women, but mm -hmm. maybe a man would get, uh, I don't know mm -hmm. what, you know? Yeah. So I appreciate that you've done yeah. all the demos. Yeah, so what, yeah. what, what would you say about, you know, the male versus female therapist, the black versus white therapist in therapy and in life, I find yeah. In therapy and in life, I find that black women are usually right. <laughs> and sometimes it's very frustrating because sometimes you'll be like, no, but I'm just, and they're like, no, no, no. And you, you can feel it being right. You know what I mean? But also I think. So the black the, female therapists have been on point. Yeah. Cause like, even when I was in college, I went to see someone and I don't know, it was like, maybe some of it was college. Cause I also try to take stock of where I was in my life at the time and how much I needed to talk to the person I was talking to. Because I think that when I have been at my, what ironically, when I've been at my most like dire straits and I need to go to somebody for free or like for whatever insurance would handle or whatever, it ended up being a white woman. Okay. Um, but I find that like, uh, this is how I look at uh, therapy personally. I think that there's some, homogeny might not be the right word, but there, there's something that you need where the person is, is uh, slightly similar to you, you in some that. way. You do want that. I think I want that. And so whether it's, it's a, like a white man or a black woman or someone who shares my experience in some way and right. it doesn't even have to be as as close knit as those particular uh like identity aspects it it could be something where you know even if we find out we both grew up in the same place or something that, that could be huge right um but yeah i think that i look at the mental so much like the physical that I'll tell you right now, the when I go to a doctor for my body, when I go to like just a doctor, yeah. I need my doctor uh, to be black, really, or to be a woman. Why? Because in life, I don't know, I, I can't remember exactly what this is called, but just through study, they found that in medicine, a lot of people don't take black pain seriously. Absolutely so true. then a black doctor will be like, no, that looked like it hurt, right? Like there, there right. won't be any like mixing, right? Oh, oh and, you, then, and a woman would feel that empathy as well. And a woman would have that as well because there's still things, like we've been to the moon and we're still like, I don't know what's going on over there. You know what I mean? <laughs> we still do that in medicine, modern day, 2023. So you just don't want a white man who might, who might be pulling from some of these old things about, you know, black people feel pain less or, or whatever. I, and yes, to a certain degree, but it's not even that I'm actively not seeking 
a, a white man. It's more that I am seeking these people. So it's not as if like, like, let's say my doctor was sick, but I was sick. So I still needed the appointment. And then a white man walks in. I'm not going to be like, oh, no, 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 no. Uh -uh, I heard about this. I'm going to still <laughs> accept help from a professional. Right. But I think that if, if we're talking about preference, you sure. know, and and I think, you know, I remember one time um, um, I tried a new doctor yeah. And so I had not been to this office before, not gone to this doctor before. I just knew that my insurance covered them and in network, whatever. And then she walked in and it was a pregnant white woman. And I was <laughs> like, oh, thank goodness, because you, you're you going through so much right now. You probably feel however I feel. When I describe that, that's probably good. You're going to say, oh, yeah, me too. See, right? I don't care who is my physician, because mm -hmm. I feel like. Neck down or maybe eyebrows down, mm -hmm. I'm pretty much an average person. I don't have any crazy diseases. Mm -hmm. I'm probably pretty much like most people who mm -hmm. walk in the door. If you understand the body, you understand my body. You know, my sister's a doctor, so I know how hard they work to become doctors. I'm like, white man, Asian woman, whatever. Whoever walks through that door in a white coat, I'm like, I am, I'm here to listen, right? Mm -hmm. And talk and listen. Mm -hmm. But you want to get into my head, I'm like, your identity is absolutely going to shape your understanding of what's coming out of my mouth, mm -hmm. right? My way of interacting in the world. Somebody said that that they mainly meant demographically, that if you were to switch places with other people, with white people, with with women, what have you, the world would look so different that you would barely recognize it. Mm -hmm. And think about it, like the way a woman walks down the street, almost defensively, mm -hmm. is entirely different than the way we walk down the street, right? And that's just one tiny interaction. Yeah. Um, I would, I would be, it would, it would be concerning to me. This one, once I was in therapy and one of the issues that I had in the back of my mind at that time, I was smoking a lot of weed mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, this is perhaps an opportunity to get somebody to tell you to stop. Like the other voice in my head, right? Like there's all the voices like, yeah, we just need to smoke more weed. And there was one voice that's like, she could probably get you stopped. Now this person was a good bit older than me, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said like, yeah, you know, I think I smoke too much weed. Just assuming that that person would take the bait and like, and she goes, reefer? And it just killed yeah. the whole interaction. Yeah. If that's what you think I'm talking about, yeah. we're not talking about the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then the the thing that I will say about just the world is is that physically, sometimes I like an old doctor. Right. Because you got you to here. Right. Like you live this long. So clearly you know how to live till 80, right? Because <laughs> you're old and you're still a doctor. You got your wits about you, whatever, right? Get me to at least where you got yourself, right? But some of that's genetics. Some of it is genetics, but I'd like to believe that some of it is is them. But if like he's actively. not if he's not telling you his diet, that's true. Yeah, no, fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. And then for for my mind, I think you know, it's never lost on me that sometimes not having the perspective is a good thing because I know that. When in situations like when I've had two friends who were who were dating, um, both independently come to me on their own, complaining about make potentially the same fight, right? Mm. So they had a fight. I'm friends with him. I'm friends with her, and then they both come to me. You know, whatever, right? And I think because I care so little, I'm able to give <laughs> objective advice. Like, be, like because I because I have no stake in the game, right, and right. I'm not fighting their fight. Right. I'm like. That's where you messed up right there when you said that thing. I understand right. you're telling me why you said it. I understand why you said it. Right. But that's where you Shouldn't messed have up. Said that. And then you over here, it's like, uh, is it really about this? Or are you trying to bait, you know, mm. like and I think that I can have that because I'm not in it. So so that's why I like I like I said before, if I've ever been in a situation where this is who my insurance will cover, mentally or physically. Yeah, yeah. Then I then I go with it. There's options now that there weren't in the earlier was parts that, of the 2000s. Is that an example of you 
with the two friends, gaining tools from therapy so you can be better, more healthier, more effective in the world? Maybe. I think that I, this is my thing, I guess, is that therapy, I think a lot of people think of therapy, and I even thought about this way um, for a long time, but they think it's where you're supposed to have epiphanies, where you're supposed yes. to transform and everything. You know. And it's like sometimes, but sometimes you just don't have that stuff to do it with. Right. Mm, right, So sometimes I personally think therapy is a place to be petty. It's a place to get stuff out that you, that, that you don't want to make other people's problems because things that are like the way to me that I, that I operate and the way that I think other people operate, whether they like this framework or not, is that in here, there are problems, right? And those can either manifest because right now we have the, the small problems, right? Right. Right. Those can either get bigger And they can end up being your problems as someone Mm -hmm. who's Mm -hmm. in contact with me. In your world, yeah. Or they can become my problems as someone who holds it all in until I let it become too big of a problem. Right. I take those problems and like, and don't get me wrong, I'm not always in therapy. I'll I'll take I'll take stints away if I'm if I'm feeling like okay, I have a lot to think about. I have a lot to work on that I don't think involves talking to this person right now and stuff like that. And when I'm at my healthiest, I'm not always going because I personally don't need it as a weekly check-in. Okay. I, I just personally don't necessarily need that unless I need it for a stint of time, right? Okay. So then me going and taking these small problems that could become big problems and hashing them out with a person who's paid for problems yeah, yeah. is my way of being like, this is the kindest thing I can do for myself and it's the kindest thing I can do for anyone that I come in contact with. And so that for me is, is more what it's about. It, there, there don't have to be these huge breakthroughs because day to day, something huge is not always happening in sure. a person's life. Sure. And so I think some people make the mistake of they do need to talk to someone, but they don't have a huge problem. Sure. So they're like, well, until I have a big deal, I don't really might as well save it. Might as well like let the bag fill sure. up and then empty the bag out in right. therapy. And you can go when the bag's half full. Yeah, you don't have to wait to go to the hospital till you're having the heart attack. Yeah, you can yeah. Go when you feel the stuff before that. Yeah, like you can go for a sprain. You don't have to be like, I'll wait till it fully breaks. But, <laughs> right. Uh, but right. but I mean, I would think if I make the time and effort to sit on this woman's couch or this man's couch. I want to try to find something that I wouldn't say to any person or any friend because this person's not your friend. Yeah. They're a trained, intelligent, Mm -hmm. uh, medical professional. Yeah. Who can like- Ideally, they're not even hot. (laughs) Wait, what? Ideally, they are not, you are not staring at a gorgeous person while you are telling them everything that's wrong with you. Wait, why is that ideal? Because I just, I I don't want a hot person- (laughs) Being like, yes, <laughs> what is wrong with you? But I see, I would feel more comfortable sharing with a hot person. Really? Yeah. That's very secure of you. I, I, <laughs> That's I, wild. I like you. I want to create community with you. <laughs> like, no. like let, no. let, let me just share my whole heart with I you. I don't even like having hot trainers. Because the thing, my trainer, my, my trainer is very good looking, right? <laughs> okay. And it's, and it's upsetting because uh, all a trainer is is a hot person telling you to be hot like this like <laughs> that's do you know how do you know how mad you get but the like, person's but already like, done cooking but it, but and they're it, telling you no you, be hot like me but you're telling you're like look you could be like me if you listen to what i'm saying and i'm like yes i want to look like you yes i want to be healthy like you like i remember the first time we went to my wife and i we went to um bikram yoga mm-hmm and have you ever done it? No, it's no, It's freaking no. awesome. I mean, Bikram yoga is not awesome anymore because he's a horrible person. But hot yoga in general, uh-huh. right, is, yeah. is great, right? Yeah. Um, but we're looking around the room. The fucking, there's the teacher's hot as shit. There's other teachers in the room. Yeah. They're hot as shit. Yeah. The, like half the classes. I'm like, yo, I'm in the right place. Like, let's go. I'm with you, except <laughs> this is the thing. I was saying I don't even like that thing, but for the, but for the mental side, 
there's no amount of growth that's going right. to chisel your jaw. Right. So now I will leave maybe maybe relaxed, maybe like a weight is lifted off my shoulders, but still staring at a gorgeous person. But you as a man, uh -huh. you can look good mm -hmm. to women or so I'm told by just having the, I mean, obviously the cheekbones and the mm -hmm. hair help, but like if you are comfortable in your skin and mm -hmm. you're rela relaxed and you're radiating self-confidence, that alone is attractive to that, right? We're mm -hmm. just attracted to like, she looks good. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk to her. They're yeah. like, he's radiating confidence and security and like maturity. And like, I'm attracted to that. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> You're right. You're right. So you but can get I'm to talking that about with therapy, I would think. Yeah, but even if I'm there, we're talking about me having to stare at somebody hot. We're talking. <laughs> Does the age matter? Like, do you want somebody who's about your age and like fresh out of school, mm. or like your mom, dad's age, so they can give you the? Because it's it's not yeah. about wisdom. It's 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 scientific, right? So it's, like a thirty year old. I think though, if someone is slightly older, this is going to be biased. Like, but if someone is slightly older, even if it's about the science, I personally feel like they've had more time with the science so and they've you had want more that. time and experience with their practice. Uh, so I would prefer that, even if it's slight. It's like if you're this. This is this is how how bad off I am though. Is like let's say twenty years down the line, right? I get a therapist that's 15 years younger than me. A part of me is going to already have that old black man in me. It's like, what do you know? <laughs> who, who, who you think you talk to? You know what I mean? Like, that's going to come out at some point. Be like, oh, okay, okay. You're going to be that guy little, <laughs> little, Young nigga think he know what's up. All right. All right. Cool, cool, cool. You going to tell me about my trial? All right. Tell, you know tell I mean? me something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My trial was for when you were born. All right. <laughs> All the trauma I'm telling you about right now, you ain't here. I ain't never seen. You think you seen trauma because you, you went to middle school and stuff. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm. I would become that you person. You don't know nothing about. Yo, I, I do feel a slight struggle to trust them, right? Yeah. Because the they are getting paid based on you continuing to come. Mm -hmm. So if they get you to a place where you feel, you know, and, and maybe therapists are listening to this like horrified, like you're completely wrong. And mm -hmm. I accept that because mm -hmm. I am very green in the field. Mm -hmm. But the feeling is they don't really have the incentive to give you all the answers and to help you get there. Because once you get there, wherever there is mm -hmm. health, peace, whatever, mm -hmm. then you're like, thank you so much, doctor. I don't really need to see you anymore. Mm -hmm. And then. They're not getting your 250 a week anymore. And yeah. you know, in New York, there's more therapists than citizens. But yeah. in other cities, I'm sure it's a little bit more of a yeah, work a to get the yeah. business and right. But is that's is that okay. total bullshit? Look, I'll tell you this and once again, this is like this is this one time and it was one friend. So I'm not saying everybody's doing this, but too much the way that my friend described it to me is that. So he was going to therapy and then he was about to stop going to therapy because he was going to move. And so <laughs> at the last session, um, the, the therapist was like, this is when therapy's over, right? So clock's off, but we still got to talk business and everything. Right, right. And the therapist was like, well, you've been out of network for a while. So the, the charge did go up and you're behind. So I'll need you to pay me before you move. And she knew he had the money because he was talking to her in therapy about moving <laughs> and how much he had saved. <laughs> so she knew he had it. So it's a lot like, like which which technically is not her fault because she didn't pull it out of him how much he had. He just willfully gave it. But it's a lot like asking out the bank teller at the bank. They can see what's in the account. So it's like, why would I? Ooh, 43? So is that all for me or... What are we? What are we doing? What are we doing here? I would. I, I went on a date one time that uh, this was so bad. I went on a date and I didn't realize I didn't have cash in the in the moment. So then I went to the ATM and I only had uh, nineteen ninety eight in my account. 
Oh my God. So then I couldn't do that. And I, and I had specifically gone to a chase ATM to not get the ATM fees. Right, right, right. And like, I was, it's, it was hostage. It's trapped. <laughs> so what did you do? I just, I did. I, we went for a walk. I was just like, I was like, hey, you know, stars out, girl. You know, it's 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 a, it's so romantic. Let's just walk. You know, why would we eat when we could burn calories? You know what I mean? <laughs> she she went for that. Did you get a second date? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not she saw through your shit. Yeah, hundred percent. Immediately, hundred percent. Because I didn't even say the. I didn't even say let's go for a walk confidently. I just started walking, <laughs> and so then we were walking together and talking and everything. And then she was like, she was. What is it? She said she was like, oh, so at and this is after a while. She's like, oh, are we close to the like restaurant? Oh. And then I was like, oh, you still want to go? <laughs> Cause when you talk about broke, like when you when you talk about trifling, when I was broke, I was like, I was probably, I was, I would, I would have no problem admitting I was a nightmare when I was broke, cause it would, it was like that early twenties broke where yeah. everybody's broke. Yeah. So some people were very forgiving. They were like, yeah. I am also broke. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But then some people were like, ah, <laughs> what? So you weren't leading us anywhere or anything? It's like, no, it's just a beautiful night. You know, I thought maybe you'd enjoy a walk. We were already talking. You know what I mean? And then it was it was a it was a couple miles back and I didn't want to interrupt you. So we just kept walking this way. Ah. You know? Yo, all the girls say, if you ask them what they want in a guy, mm. what's the first thing they say? Mm. What's the first thing they say? Oh, I don't, I don't sense know. Sense of humor. Oh, sense of humor. They, okay. Oh, that's always the first thing oh, they wow. say. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's and funny. And then secondarily, yeah. then they'll start talking about money and I want to make sure that he can take care of me and mm -hmm. pay pay the bill, the yeah. date, whatever. Yeah. But first thing they all all say first, sense yeah. of humor. Right? Yeah. Looks and height may come yeah. third, fourth, whatever, whatever. This, this is what bothers me about, because this is the way in the world people don't realize that they don't actually want comedians is because we get it. Like we get it on all sides. It's like, so from the male comics perspective, right? It's like, yes, people say that. And then it's like, what I found is that a lot of women end up making the guy that they're already attracted to funny to them. Mm. So then I can't tell you how many times I've had a friend who's like, Oh, you have to meet this like new guy she's dating. You have to meet my boyfriend. He's so funny. You'd love him. And then I meet the dude and someone who writes jokes for a living. I was like, this, he's not funny. He's not funny at all. That's, that's, you should stop hyping him up because he's really not funny. When I tell you he's not funny, trust me. And my but friends are funny. She just liked him. Thus, she found just liked him funny. Yeah. And then one thing that guys do is that guys will also have like, Top of the list, especially like your 20s, early 30s and stuff. It's like, I just want a girl can hang. You know what I mean? Like just mm. somebody that's like laid back, chill, whatever. Mm. And it's like, yes, you want someone can, that can hang. But you don't want someone who can hang better than you. So then when people start dating a female comic and then she comes around your friends at the barbecue and she's making everybody laugh. Now you see dudes salty just saying, these are my friends. <laughs> How you gonna come over to I invited you and then I'm trying to tell my story. You got everybody in the kitchen. What? Nobody Wait. even watching the game. You know what I mean? So now you're now you're dating, you know, this like hilarious uh comic and she's killing in a room full of your friends. Uh, and that and then, and she might even be roasting you. She might even right. be be hanging so well right. that she's busting your balls like your buddies do it. Now you're like, I right, but that's that's I told you that in private. <laughs> I told you, you that in private. That's not, that that's, not really, that's not really for everybody. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so should. then whether you're a, a male comic, female comic, it's like it always comes back to bite you because it's like, yes, that's what people say that they want, but they want a version of that. Like, like when guys say that, when they say they want someone who can hang, a lot of those dudes that say that just be someone who's quiet. Yes. That's that's like no one wants to admit that, but that's truly happening. There will be someone it's, who, it, who they it means date. Is, let me play my video games in peace. <laughs> let, let me play my video oh, and then when I bring you to the to the Super Bowl party and you end up not saying anything and everybody's like, "Man, she's so cool." <laughs> 
That would be dope. That part where she like didn't say anything for three hours was like <laughs> so was dope. So awesome. And I'm like, and she didn't even complain while you were watching the post game. That was yeah, she's so like, cool. It's like she's so cool. And it's like someone who's actually cool ends up not being able to get a date. Mm. And then someone who's actually funny ends up getting but passed wait, over for but, people but, with but, chiseled jaws. When, <laughs> when you're actually funny though, mm -hmm. does that not help a lot? It can, but it's not not like you would think because because for all the reasons that I just gave, people who are truly funny to their core deep down, and there's no let me turn it on, there's no like yeah. just that's how they move through yeah. the world. Yeah. I don't think it gets appreciated except by other comedians because really? it's it's such a thing for us that when someone is just oozing, I mean, imagine if like the guitar never left Jimi Hendrix's hands yeah, yeah. and just he would bump into someone at, 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 at a, at a coffee shop and it just started playing. You'd be like, this is amazing. Yeah. I'm watching Jimi Hendrix play just like riff a couple of licks. Yeah. You know what I mean? But with comedy, it's like, okay, on stage, that's very funny. I enjoyed it. That, that was great. Or maybe even they're one of the best, or maybe even they're my favorite. And then if you meet them, and let's say you're getting a chance to meet this comic you love and they're funny in that moment, you're like, wow, you're just as funny here as you are there, whatever. After a while, it's like, ah, uh, ah, uh, this isn't, it's almost annoying. Really? When I mean, someone's so. See, see, unlike our response to music, uh -huh. our response to com comedy is involuntary. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Whether or not. I see it coming, whether or not I like you, mm -hmm. you hit the right note and the right time and the right word, I'm gonna laugh. Mm -hmm. Even I'm like, don't laugh, don't laugh, don't laugh, right? Like the my appreciate, I mean, you know, my son's named Hendrix, right? So obviously I, you know, but like, if I'm not in the mood for Jimmy strumming, you know, whatever the, like right now, like, dude, you're outside of McDonald's. Like I'm, I'm, I'm gotta go to work. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, yeah. you know, or I don't have an appreciation. Yeah, yeah. I don't have an appreciation for Bach with your fucking pit. Like I'm good, yeah. dude, leave me alone. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But if fucking Josh or cat or whatever is standing outside of McDonald's and says, ha ha ha. Says, I'm like, Oh, that was really funny. I get, you know, yeah. the yeah. then occasionally you run into every once in a blue moon. There's a homeless guy who can like say something funny. You're like, Oh shit. That was generally funny. I'll give you a dollar, whatever. Yeah. And yeah. like, you know, you guys can can shock us, right? Like, yeah. I mean, like an electric shock, and like, zzz, zzz, and I'm like, holy shit, that yeah. nigga's really fucking funny. I guess my thing is just like with music, with comedy, you tune yourself in and out of it. So when someone's being observational all the time, mm -hmm. it then becomes it's almost like a kid, like like when a little kid is like, hey, dad, why? is this thing this way? And if it's something that yeah. you even wondered as a kid, now you're getting flashes of that. Yeah. There's something that you can connect with it. Yeah. But if you are busy and your kid's <laughs> like, why is it that you're like, it is what it is. <laughs> it's just, it, it exists. You know? Somebody I think it was, I forget who it was, who said that. It's the exact same thing of like, if you have kids, they're gonna get into asking, why, 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 why? And eventually you're gonna have to say, it just is the way it is. Yeah. Cause I don't know anymore. I'm not Galileo. Yeah. I cannot explain why clouds are that shape. It just is what it is. Yeah. And that is, I think the number one thing, out, even outside of comedy, one of the things that comics do really well is that they remind people to ask why, like when they were kids. And then one of the things that keeps a person young and creative is asking why, like when they were a kid, because if you get too much, if you get too much why, you're just annoying. Because mm. then some of it is like, well, Google. Mm. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and then some of it is also if it always is what it is, that that's how a person becomes like out of touch, old in a sense, boring in a sense, mm. because because not everything should be the way that it is. You mm -hmm. know, it's mm -hmm. like it. Uh, I guess the best example is like when you look at. Um, when you look at TSA versus <laughs> versus like gun policy at the, the airport. So no, no. So gun policy in America, TSA at the airport. Right, right, right. You're like, wow. It took one guy with one 
bomb in the shoe mm. to like change how we all go through the whole industry. Changed how I fly to Denver now. Because one guy that you caught, by the way, you got him. It wasn't like he blew up the shoe and no. killed everybody. No. You caught him. Right. right? right. But still, and that was a long time ago. Right. Still, you have to pop, pop. Here's Shoes my socks and, and whatever, yeah. right? And I'm especially bitter about that because nobody is like meaner off the cuff than than people at TSA. I okay, so I take my shoes off. This is before I pre-check, right? So uh, I had to take my shoes off, take my laptop out. Was going through the the metal detector, and I I was in a rush to get to the airport. So I'm about to miss my flight, especially off the TSA line, right? And so I didn't realize that there was a hole in my sock. So then I got the hole in my sock. I'm standing in the thing. I got my hands up standing like this. And then she points to her friend. She's like, look at Oliver Twist, right? Which is already Shut like- Shut your mouth. Which is already <laughs> like, this is so unprofessional. Like, and I have to but stay she, like this because I don't know what I'm saying. like what, 19th century literature? Look at Oliver hey, Twist? Hey, mean can be smart. <laughs> And so then she's like, look at Oliver Twist. And then I'm just standing there like this, like, can you like machine girl? I'm about to miss my So I I hate TSA for a long time. And then you look at that versus you look at like gun policy in America. Yo. And no matter how many people get killed, we're like, there's nothing we can do. Nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. It says only nation where this happens. Yeah. There, I mean, there's nothing that we could do. All we can really hope for is that after a certain amount of shootings, some of the shooters are shooting future shooters. That's the only thing <laughs> as Americans that we can hope happens is that just by by proximity, they'll shoot somebody else crazy oh and then we will prevent a shooting by letting a shooter do a shooting. Sure. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. And sure. it's like it's like, okay, but you got to both of those things. Yeah, yeah. It's like you got to both of those things by asking why. Because you go to the airport and you're like, wait. They caught him and they caught him like, what, two decades ago? So why do I still have to take my shoes off for the guy that they caught? You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, uh, you know, but if you're under 12, yeah, you don't have to take your shoes off. And if you've pre-checked, yeah. you don't have to take your shoes off. Which is crazy because if you are a young enough terrorist, <laughs> we'll let you get away with it. Also, Pre-check is not that expensive. I understand that no, it's not at all. different people in different demographics of America, an extra $85 is like is is a of lot course, of money. Of course, if they lost course. $85, you'd lose your mind out of, of your course, wallet. Of course. If you got mugged and you lost $85, you'd lose it, right? Sure, of course. But $85 for five years is not a lot of money in, in terms of money that's that's just going through America, right? Sure. And so the idea that a terrorist organization doesn't have enough funding to pay $85 to get pre-check. You've seen this. There's this other thing they do now in some places where the the line, before you even get to the, the beeping machines, mm -hmm. there's this large empty space where you and two other strangers are supposed to walk through at the same speed. Very important. You must walk together. Mm -hmm. And there's blowers and there's the German shepherds that are walking around you mm -hmm. as you're walking through this 20 yard space. Mm -hmm. Oh, you must stay at the same pace. You can't. Okay, okay, okay. They're looking for drugs. Mm -hmm. They're not, that has nothing to do yeah. with the supposed war on terror. This yeah. is the war on drugs and the war on terror has allowed the war on drugs to expand. Yeah. Because they can say anything, anything in the name of security. Yeah. We can do. You also have to ask why why do they not want us to be high? <laughs> Is it really that bad? Cuz I've been around lots of types of high cuz when you don't have money, you live where the high is. <laughs> like not the not the good high. Like I've I've been around people in LA doing cocaine and I've been around people in Chicago doing the new drugs. Like mm. new, and new drugs you cannot I look at new drugs the way I look at new religions, where I'm like, no, the old ones have done just fine. <laughs> Don't do anything new. Wait, what? Are, when you say the new drugs, what are you talking about? Uh, I'm talking about like someone who has a new spin on meth, right? Because <laughs> there's stuff on the street that you don't even you don't even hear about it. Because that's how you like. I'm I'm projecting now, but it's like I feel like 
you have a good life? Because I'm assuming you don't find out about the new drugs till they hit the news. <laughs> Is that fair? Is that fair to say? For, that- for me, no. There, there was a period in my life mm-hmm. when I was in a wa- ongoing conversation about what is out there. What is mm-hmm. there that people can do? Mm-hmm. I want to have a variety of experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember somebody telling me about DMT. Yeah, yeah. And the thing was like, it's like experiencing death. Mm-hmm. And I was like, why would I want that? Yeah, but this <laughs> is my like thing. when they're like, we're gonna give you Molly, and yeah. you're gonna have an ecstatic hi yeah. and you're gonna my 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 girlfriend now wife we did molly together mm-hmm. and our big takeaway we like touch fingertips a lot mm-hmm. yeah there you <laughs> and, go right we were outside in the winter and it was cold and we didn't care yeah and we both decided that we're going to go see our grandmothers because you know we love them and they're so sweet mm-hmm. like <laughs> Yeah, like that's the Molly shit. Yeah, and yeah. that's great. Mm-hmm. The DMT shit. I'm like, why would I want to experience death? Well, the way that it was described to me is that with DMT, you are actually, uh, it's like meditation in a way where when you get to a deep enough meditative state, you end up. I don't know how to how to fully describe it, but you end up in a place that's sort of the edge of your like reasoning and and reality and everything. And the way the DMT was described to me, the death thing I've heard as well, but the first way it was described to me was almost like, because they gave it to a monk in a a sort of experiment. And he was like, this place is is where it took me 20 years of a meditative practice to get to. So with, yeah, with DMT, you go to this deeper place. Now, I don't know if you can or really should go to that deeper place flippantly. But I think that if someone is on a sort of spiritual journey, then DMT does offer up some form of um, like some form of self-exploration that yeah. is a sort of shortcut and a cheat code to get to a place that would normally take thousands of hours of quieting your mind yeah. of, of deep, deep thought um, and then release of thought. And so for me, when I say new drugs, I don't necessarily mean the, um, fun or explorative stuff. I'm talking like, do you remember that knockoff weed that was like making people freak out? That's kind of what I'm talking about. Yeah. The synthetic weed. It's like when you're on the ground and you have no money, you're watching the people who were experimenting with that, where they're Uh like, Oh, I just like to forget that I'm here. And then they smoke whatever they smoke. That's how I feel about new drugs. You know, you ever done ayahuasca? I've never done anything. That was the, you've never done any drugs? No. No. Oh, you should try it. I think I'm me. like, I want, this is the thing. If I were ever to do a drug, I want to do the sort of like exploration, the sort of like uh, mind opening yeah. type things. That's what ayahuasca is. And I've heard that, this, this is my thing with ayahuasca, where I think I would have to go, I would have to go, do it authentically because yeah. the thing that happened with ayahuasca in the sort of westernization of it yeah, yeah. is that now we're literally all the way down to people taking it in a high school gym after hours no. with you, you know what I'm saying like like now we're down to like the fuckboy gurus that I mean, are giving people <laughs> ayahuasca I mean it's hours so you need the right space I mean like you need a comfortable space because your body will just basically just stop working and just become mush yeah and it's like your mind expands but your body doesn't and this is why people are in ta- in, in in blankets because you're not going to move really for hours mm. so you better be comfortable where you're sitting mm. and if you don't move you're going to get cold right so that's mm. why you're right but like just the mental expansion into the afterlife the future the 4,000 foot, v- it was extraordinary. What was your experience like then? Oh my God. I mean, I think I, I you know, one thing that happened is that I found myself like, ex- like finding m- old memories and nothing even significant, just like, oh, that time that I was walking along 
the street and found that cool little rock. I didn't even, like, if you'd asked me, like, later that day, I wouldn't have remembered that moment. But, like, ye, you know, 30, 40 years later, it, I saw that picture again. Mm -hmm. And it did make me think every experience is in there. Mm -hmm. You just can't access it. Mm -hmm. But it's in your memory somewhere. Everything yeah. you've ever seen or experienced. Yeah. Which yeah. was like, that was insane to sort yeah. of like have that realization of like, I'm seeing lots of images of just tiny things from long, yeah. long ago. Like, because then was you're crazy. also, that means that, that means it's very important what you see and experience. Cause you, that's, yeah. that's why you're, you know, I, I, that makes a lot of sense. Cause if that, if that thing is so true of people, it would make sense why if you, feel like you're at a dead end or you feel like you're filling your life with things that are, um, that are not fulfilling yeah. how it's so accumulative that you become miserable. Mm. How it's so, because like, let's say that person did do ayahuasca and then they were like, man, I've been in a job that I don't like for 20 years doing the same day, day in and day out. So then their trip is just them being like, that was Tuesday. That was Tuesday of 2008. Yo, I, I do recall vividly being, I think it was like fifth, sixth grade and like Sunday night. This is hard to even <laughs> recall this memory. Like early Sunday evening, I would get really depressed because mm -hmm. it was like, there's this rhythm and routine to life. So nothing is growing and changing. You just keep doing the same thing. The end of the foot, because my father was big into foot, the NFL, we watch the football game. It ends. We have dinner. We have to take a shower. We go back into the school week. And it's the same fucking thing over and over and over. And that was part of why I don't think I fully articulated it in that moment. But it's kind of like, this is why I have to become like some sort of creative person. Because mm -hmm. if I go into like a normal, quote unquote, normal field, and I'm like doing the same thing over and over again. Like I, I couldn't handle that. Mm. But like, you know, we're in creative work. So it's like every day, every week is going to be different. Yeah. Right. So yeah. like I, you know, so I don't get into that. Like, oh, the routine of it all. I could I, like, I couldn't do that. Yeah. That makes sense though. I think that I, I feel similar in a, in a way because, yeah. you know, I think I've, I've been good enough about jumping from thing to thing that I never felt that sort of depression towards it. But I think that if I wasn't, if I was, uh, how do I put it? It's like, I think if I was doing the same thing for several weeks that was not in any way changing and I didn't know it was working towards a specific goal, yeah. then, cause even if you go to the gym, let's say you make um, building up your body, the prime focus of your life. Let's say you had, you had some sort of health scare and you were like, you know what? I got money. I got time. Let me make yeah. this my priority. Even in the repetition of that, you're still working towards a goal that yeah. you'll be able to see and enjoy. But if, if I were just working somewhere and I was like, I guess I'm making them money. I don't know. I think it would lead to like a deep depression. <sighs> Your Oliver Twist uh, anecdote. Yeah. hysterical you reminded me of i was in bryant park years ago doing an event with aisha tyler who's mm -hmm. fucking hysterical mm -hmm. and we were talking about her new book right and so it's an outdoor public event so anybody can you know and it's new york city like anybody's gonna and they normally in that spot did shakespeare events so to do an event with her was a little bit off the beaten path and before we started, the organizer was like, you see that guy over there wearing two trash bags? Try to avoid calling on him if you can. Try to avoid. Right, 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 <laughs> yeah. right. He Try to avoid. The events. And like, this is like New York, middle-aged, not even middle-aged, but middle-aged, yeah, middle-aged white man, homeless, wearing trash bags, looks a fucking mess, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, so we get to the Q&A. His hand goes up. I pretend I don't see. I call on the woman in the front row. Second question. His hand goes up. Pretend I don't see. Call on a man. Third question. 
there's really not that many hands. And I really can't continue to pretend I don't see him. So finally, I'm like, sir, what is your question? And he starts in on this deep and beautifully articulated question about Shakespeare. And he's like, I was actually studying Shakespeare at Yale. And for the first good 90 seconds, it was like really brilliant. And I'm like, holy shit, in New York, even the homeless have advanced degrees about yeah, like us. Yeah. Like, oh my God. And then after about 90 seconds, the sentence started or the paragraph started to crumble into nothingness. And like, okay, so here's where the mental illness yeah. gets him. He can yeah. do 90 seconds of lucidity and then ah. he's gonna freak. Ah. And then it became just like, and like, okay, well, thank you so much for that. Like, yeah. it was a brilliant question at first, and we see it's not your fault, and oh, we cannot answer anything about Shakespeare, but thank yeah. you for that. But it was, it, it, it was, it was an interesting sort of like, just like high literature yeah. just intrudes on a daily moment. I will say that uh, in Chicago, I, f I ended up talking to people with like varying degrees of mental health, just like mm. on the train. Cause I, I don't know. I think I just have a face that says I want to talk. <laughs> Cause like people would just roll up and I'm like, I'm like affable enough that I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be there for a while. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, why not chat? You know? And I, I made friends that way. I made like, and it, it's something that I never told my mom because it just sounds concerning of how many friends I made on the train. Like that just, no matter how old you are, it sounds like you're about to be kidnapped. It like, does. No, we met on the train. It it's does. Like, it never does. mind the fact that everybody takes the train. So of no, course you're going to, you know. We're not meeting people on the train. Yeah. And so I remember I was talking to someone who was like, yeah, I was homeless. So we just started chatting because I think I was reading a book and he was like, he was like, are you enjoying that book? And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then we just kept chatting because we, turns out he lived one stop away from me. Oh. So we were on the train for almost equal amount of time. And, you know, that led to a discussion of like, I, I wasn't necessarily asking these questions, but he was offering up how he had been homeless for two years. And he looked relatively, he looked like my age. So I was like, oh, you're talking like 20 and 21, you were homeless, you know, whatever. <sighs> And, and so then he was like, yeah, because it took me, it took me a while to realize, I think he said, it took me a while to get diagnosed as bipolar. And it took me longer to accept I was bipolar wow. because he's like, when you're having an episode, no matter what mental health struggle you have, when you have an episode, sometimes you don't even feel crazy. You feel right. Yes. And so then it's like, the thing is, if a person feels crazy, there's a thing within them that that has some doubt. Like I've felt crazy before. I've had like, um, I won't even call them episodes because I didn't do anything necessarily outlandish, but I, you know, I would have these bouts of almost mania where I felt like I needed to get so much done. I was getting all this energy and I was like, and and I was almost stressed with how much energy I had and and I would be like trying to make up things to do and everything. And in that moment, I felt crazy because I'm like, I'm so wired and it's like, I don't really take in caffeine. I don't do any drugs. I don't know where this is coming from. Right. So it's like, I'm, I'm freaking out. Um, and he was saying that for him, he just felt right. So whatever the thing he was that he was going on and on about, it didn't feel like he was losing his mind. He felt like, no, why don't you, you all see the thing that I'm clearly saying to you. Mm -hmm. And then for him, he's like on the outside, I wasn't saying anything. Mm -hmm. And so then no one could really help me. No one could get a hold of me, listen to me, whatever. And for, I, I think he, I think he had stopped talking to his family. So it really took him getting on his feet by himself in Chicago for mm. him to like get out of the situation and find a place to stay and, and have friends and, you know, it started with a friend group that was letting him stay certain places and everything. And then he finally got his own place and, you know, had a job while he was doing that. And I was just like, wow. I think that's also why I talk to people on the train. Cause it's like, that was all offered up in like 40 minutes, you know, Is like this helpful. Um, he just, he just had a, he, he just had a question and no book. So it was like, all right, he was, he was open, you know?
But what was helpful? What was was it? this, is this helpful of just meeting strangers yeah. in this way? It's the most like, helpful thing. It's the most helpful thing in the world because people ask me like how I write comedy, my process, all this stuff like that. I think that engaging in meaningful conversation with people and like real conversation, because the thing is, most it's it's a sad thing to say, and and I wish it wasn't true, but like most people are not engaging in real conversations for most of their life. You're right. talking to people, you're projecting your ideas, and you're right. waiting to talk again. Yes. And so when you have a real conversation where you're interested in what the other person is saying, you're reacting to what they're saying, you're you're like enthralled with what they're telling you and you're getting a piece of them because we give more of that when we feel like we're, it's being received. I think that that's the closest thing to process to, uh, to structure and perspective that I get for comedy is that the whole reason I think about things the way that I think about them is because I've talked to people sure. and because I've been able to watch people. Like obviously observational humor is gonna come from watching people. Like best example I can give and stop me if I already told you this, because now we've talked a few times. So this is where you hit that point with a friend where you're like, oh, and this one time, and they're like, no, I know, I know, I know. Um, but why do we need to make sure that we have, We I know that I have told you this before. Like, why do mm. I have to say that? Because I could probably tell you something else. If it, like, <laughs> like to to a certain degree, if, if I'm trying to illustrate this point, if I've already told you, then I could illustrate it better with something okay. different to get a better reaction and feel like we're having a real conversation. Okay. It also undercuts previous conversations because then it makes the person feel like, oh, so you were just talking at me. You don't even remember what but you told do you, me. I mean, I mean, if we talk for several hours, I may not remember, did I tell you this story? I don't mm -hmm. know. Did I tell you that observation? Like, yeah, I, I, I don't, don't expect, remember everything. I don't expect everyone to remember what they've told. I don't think that. I'm just saying it could come off that way okay. to a person. Okay. Um, I was on a train. And I happened to see another I comic friend. There we I'm go. Kidding, I'm kidding, I'm, no, I'm I was worried. I'm I was kidding, like, I'm kidding. hey, this I, might be I don't it. have enough information. I yeah. may have heard the story before. I don't know. Yeah. Is this, is this camera on right here? Is yes. this one working? Yeah. Imagine <laughs> me just looking at it. I told you. Did not tell you. <laughs> I feel like I've actually been cheating away from this camera the whole time, which it's is okay, a, I'm, I've made it horrible for your editing tape, but I'd like to apologize down the barrel to whoever's going to be editing this. Maybe as you, if you're editing this, I'm sorry, but like, Right down here. What a mistake. Anyway, and I've done it for most of the time. I've been like, huh, what do I think? Uh, I think we'll be okay. So so basically- I We'll was just all, splice in from the other interviews. That that would be great. I think I am wearing the same jacket. Well, nobody will know. I don't buy clothes often. So um, basically I was on the train and I saw another comic friend of mine and we were just chatting. And then this couple got on the train. And I don't know what their situation was like. I don't, I don't know. They didn't, they did not look like they were doing great. They did look a bit destitute. Right. But, and I also don't know what happened before they got on the train, but she is letting him have it mm -mm. in a way that is biblical. Like I, <laughs> like I have not seen this happen in person in a long time. And she's telling him everything he will ever need to know about himself. There will be no questions by the time she's done. And she's, cur she's standing up and he's sitting down and she's cursing him out so much that she's running out of breath <laughs> genuinely. Right. And I don't know like if there's any sort of like uh, explicit or content, like thing on the show. Go like, for do, it. Okay. But she, and she's saying stuff that's egregious, like right? What, like, like, what? like, so she is like, um, you're not even a real man. You can't even, you can't even make a baby. Most men are trying to not make one. Right. <gasps> and then, and then she's oh. like, she's like, uh, what is it too? She said, she was like, uh, and I, and then, then you can't, can't even, can't even keep your dick hard. And when it is hard, it's sharp as hell. All right. <laughs> How you <call> <laughs> Oh, you're going to have a dick this sharp, right? And then and he's just stone-faced staring. Like the, whole, like the whole time he's just staring like this, just like looking ahead. Not even looking at her. She's standing over him cursing. He's just looking ahead like this. She curses him out for nine stops, okay? Because I was on the south side doing a show, and I got to get all the way back to the That's north side time. to get home. So I'm going to be on the train for like an hour. Nine full stops of her cursing. And people are trying not to laugh because these are like 
relationship ending things. Sure, right? sure, sure. And and so people are trying not to let people are getting on, getting off. She's still cursing about going, going, going. By the time she is done, she <laughs> I've never cursed someone out so much that I was doubled over. Like I just ran a marathon, but she's doubled over, cannot like she cannot breathe. She's like, oh, oh, you know, and then he just gives her this look, like the same look he's had staring forward. But he <laughs> he finally realizes that she's done, right? And he just turns to her and he goes, You goofy bitch. <laughs> And the entire train explodes, <laughs> like with like, because we've all been like, this guy's gonna lose it. Like these are mm-hmm. these are horrible details I know about him, and I don't know him. Like I don't know his name, but I know he can't make a baby. I know he got a very sharp penis. Like this is horrible stuff. Why do I know this? Yeah, and and then he just goes, "You goofy bitch," <laughs> and then everyone laughs. She sits down next to him, and they just sit in silence. Until I got off the train, like, and that for me, you know, you can't do observational humor without observing. You can't do like, like things that are narrative about society without having conversations with people. For me, that was like, wow, that thing is love. Oh, that's love. That, I think that's love. The fact that they, that's love. I think that they just, that was, wow, that was love. So you think they got off the train and went home and had dinner and reconciled and like kept going? I don't even know if they reconciled, but they went home together. Yeah. <laughs> Just the way, because this is the thing. When when someone loves you and, and the way you want someone to love you is just total acceptance, right? Yes. But total acceptance does not mean I'm going to pretend I enjoy all of it. Okay. And so then it's like, all right, you can go on and on about his sharp penis all you want, but you with him. You're not mad at him. And you I can do- go ahead and like get cursed at all you want, but you still were like, you... Goofy bitch. He didn't even tell her to sit down. She just was like, oh, and they sat down. It's like they needed that. But that explanation of love as total acceptance Mm -hmm. is so real. I I usually think of it as forgiveness, Mm -hmm. but I think it means the same thing, that because I love you, Mm -hmm. and this is romantic or, let's say, platonic love, like Mm -hmm. like your friends you truly love— They can say anything because Mm -hmm. you would forgive them. Mm -hmm. But somebody who's like mid in your universe, like, no, no, you can't. Yeah. I know you, Jim, you can't cross that line. But, you know, uh, Johnny can say whatever because we've gotten drunk together on his mother's basement and I love him. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, he called me ugly and I'm like, I still fuck with you. Yeah. You know, And, and, and if you love somebody so much that you could forgive them or accept them Mm -hmm. for anything, Mm -hmm. that's real love. Yeah, because the fact that she, and and there was so much, I can't even remember all of it, but it was like the fact that, yes, he has all these issues, but you're still (laughs) ending up sitting next to him at the end of this train ride, or at least as far as I see. And then the fact that she'll wild out on you like this in public, but you're still just going to sit with her and- Y'all, like, I think that movies have given us a, a, a bad and, like, kind of a kind of a delusional interpretation of what love is. Because the purest love that there is, is is the love that parents have for their kids. Right. But we forgive them or accept them yeah. or anything. Anything. You peed in my face. Yeah. Ha <laughs> <laughs> the baby peed on me, whatever. Yeah. We and you're go. not going to apologize because you don't remember. You don't even... <laughs> You know, you don't even know, you don't even know enough about life a guy, to apologize for being seven. There's a guy on TikTok who like proudly presents himself as toxic, mm-hmm. right? He concludes all his TikToks, with, stay toxic, my brothers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's like, yo, the ultimate comeback to anything that she says, you're broke, you're this, you're that, you're a mama's boy, whatever, still hit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And that's what no, your man is like. Yeah. She's like, your dick don't work, and it hurts me, and this and that, and you got no money. And he was like, still hit. <laughs> yeah. But also, it's like, in in the context of, like, we roll together. Like, I, I think that that's what people forget. It's like, at any point, don't get me wrong, this couple, very toxic. Oh, my God. It's such a trauma bond. In, insa- insanely <laughs> 
toxic, right? We're just hurting each other. Yeah, I'm sure that they trauma bonded to get where they are <laughs> right now in this moment that's horrible for everybody on the train. Oh, my God. But, wow, <laughs> they, they're they sticking it out. This didn't turn into some fist fight. This was like, look, I know you need to get it out. And, like, whatever it is about him that's instilled enough in him to not get embarrassed. Because he was like, he just looks so used to it. I've never seen oh. someone just stare ahead like they couldn't hear what was happening. He might have flipped out when they got home, though. He might have. But, like, I can only go off of what I saw. I'm and the gonna... fact that it was like they ended up. Because this is the thing. If you got on the train when I was getting off the train, they looked like a sweet couple. <laughs> they looked like two people sitting quietly, minding their business. I think we think he would flip out because we know we would flip out. But I don't know if that's their dynamic. Apparently. You know? Apparently. Because he had every reason to flip out in the moment. Be like, all he had to be like, hey, hey, we're on the train. And he would have been right. You know what I mean? Right. Let it hey, go. We Keep are your voice on down. The tra- we are in public. Everyone can hear you. Yo, you know? he knew enough to not say, can you calm down? Yeah. Because calm down is always a great thing to say in the midst of a fight. Calm down. <laughs> also, he could have been like, look, all of this, all this that you're saying right now, you could text me. <laughs> you could text me all this. It would be just as true if you use your thumbs. That you use that bass of your voice. Oh, take that you could bass sit next voice. to me and text me all this, but you want to scream <laughs> to try to embarrass me to other people. on top of yelling at me, which is already demeaning. And then just and wait until she was done like a gentleman. Like <laughs> got cursed out for nine stops. Oh, like a gentleman or like a captive. Yeah. Like <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Just you. That's goofy great. bitch. <laughs> And then they sat goofy. together. I was like, wow. <laughs> to call someone goofy is like such a flex. No one uses it enough. No. You know what I mean? People call each other all sorts of terrible names. If you just said goofy, everybody would know what you meant. You know? <laughs> There's never been someone that was called goofy where I was like, what did they do? <laughs> what someone was like, oh, yeah. And then he asked me if he could borrow my car with his goofy ass. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Why would he think he could borrow? That is a goofy He's thing. He's a fucking moron. Yeah. In the context of what you've described to me, what a goofy thing to do. It's not working out. Yeah. To wreck your car and then ask if he can borrow your car when he gets out of the shop. Very goofy. Fucking moron. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all of this. It's been yeah, hysterical. Thanks for, thank, I feel like I more did this to you than <laughs> anything else, but thank you for having me again. Maybe I'll be letting the building a fourth time. That I would be think, great. I, I think you've you've definitely qualified mm-hmm. for a fourth stamp of your card whenever yeah. you want to come back to this fine establishment. Okay, cool. I because because I feel like every time that I'm here, the set gets even <laughs> more like like I feel like the only thing we're missing now is some some sort of plant here, but like. I'm, I'm telling you, every time I come, it's like the chairs get comfier. Because the chair, I, I, this might even be the same chair. Who knows? But the chair was good last time. But this has been, I've melted into the back of this one. And even the, the mic. Same chair. It is the same chair? The same okay. Chair. It might be. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm getting more comfortable each time. You but are, like, I, I swear, even the backdrop feels a bit more like... Uh, <laughs> Artistic, I don't know. <laughs> a lot. I, I don't know. I feel like a lot is happening. A lot is I, happening. I want. I need to go back and watch the one that I was on before to see. A lot's happened. How different it is. Maybe it's not different at all. No, it's different. No, Claire's Claire. Claire's been doing a lot of Claire, work. Yeah, because Claire. She's okay. It happen. Because I'm telling you, this is. Let Claire keep working. <laughs> let me come back what a year you from she's now. Not done? No, I'm saying. I'm saying that if Claire has done this already. <laughs> She can only go up from here. That's correct. You know? That's correct. And so I feel like Claire's going to have, like, some mood lighting, too. Ooh. You know, not even just the wash that Taking gets our, you know? Because even now. <laughs> no, no, not with your hand in your palm. Like, <laughs> actual. <laughs> I feel like, because even now with the lighting, I am i don't, I won't be able to tell until I see it. But I feel like you've really washed out any lines that I have. <laughs> 
So now if you could just you have add no lines. I I mean, I you, might start to get some. You look like you're 18. That's very kind. I'm gonna take that to the I'm gonna put that you on do. my uh, on my auditions. If you said you were 18, I would believe it. Really? Mm. Is it because I can't grow the facial hair? Is that <laughs> I didn't say can't. I'm can't saying can't. can't. I know. Really? I it's patchy and it's too patchy for where I am in life. I mean, where <laughs> the amount of facial hair you have now. Yeah. One could do that at 18 or 17. Yes, yes, Good. yeah. My son has a little, he's 15. He's a little yeah, thing stubble, over his, yeah. you know? But yeah, you get you get some amber lighting as well just to like <laughs> really bring out the colors and the tone of your skin and then See? my skin when I come back. <laughs> Don't put the amber on white people. Mm -mm. It will make them look a little burned. <laughs> like like not like Maybe we Greek sun tanned burned. <laughs> But it will just be like, why is he yellow and he beautiful? You know? <laughs> we hardly ever have white people on this show, so. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's been about 99% black. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, then, yeah, amber all around. I feel like <laughs> amber is a safe bet then. Because even when you have the darker, darker skin tones, amber and a little bit of, I think, green brings out mm. uh, the color. Like, really punches up the vibrance in someone's skin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Love yeah. it. You don't have to do any of this. Thank, no, that's all clear. Oh, okay. It's all clear. Thank you so much for a great interview, and thanks to you for listening. Torre Show gives you fuel to power your dreams because you can use your dreams like a rocket ship to blast you into a life you never imagined. You can make your dreams a reality. And maybe this show can help. You can find me on Twitter at Torre and on Instagram at Torrey Show. Torrey Show is written by me, Torrey, and produced by Jennifer Brown. Our editor is Ryan Woodhall. Our booker is Claudia Jean. And we're distributed by DCP Entertainment. And we will be back next Wednesday with more amazing guests because the man can't shut us down. <laughs> <laughs>